I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I came home this afternoon and I found this on my front door. So I figured I ought at least say something. The Carl Edwards Brad Kozlowski feud at Atlanta Motor Speedway that ended with Kozlowski's car going up in the air was of concern to NASCAR for two reasons. First, they obviously weren't real happy that Carl Edwards intentionally punted Kozlowski. Second, and of more concern, is the fact that Kozlowski's car went airborne. Now, since the COT was introduced, both Carl Edwards and Ryan Newman have had off of asphalt experiences. Both happened at Talladega, and in fact, it used to be the only place you'd see a car going airborne was at a super speedway. It's very unusual to see a car getting up into the air at a mile and a half track like Atlanta. A car becomes airborne when the forces pushing upward become larger than the forces pushing downward. The car's weight and aerodynamic downforce help it stay on the ground. However, air creates forces in lots of directions. Air underneath the car can push upward, but even air flowing over the top of the car can create lift. Bernoulli's law describes the fact that faster moving air exerts less pressure. Less pressure means less force. Usually this isn't a consideration, but when a car rotates, the aerodynamics change. The yaw angle is the angle between the direction the car is heading and the direction the car is moving. So if the car is moving in the same direction it's heading, it doesn't have any yaw. If, on the other hand, the car is pointing in a different direction it's heading, then we say the car is yawed out. Now, large yaw angles are a really bad thing for race cars. The flow of air over the car creates a lot of lift on the roof and the rear window. Now, that's not new. In fact, it's why cars have roof flaps, roof rails, and shark's fins. If the pressure on top of the car gets smaller than the pressure inside the car, that pressure differential causes the roof flaps to rise. The flap perpendicular to the roof rails rises first, and then, if necessary, the angled roof flap rises. The raised roof flaps, like the roof rails and the shark's fin, slow down the air and force it to detach from the car. Incidentally, if you've ever wondered why the roof flaps are oriented the way they are, or why the shark's fin is only on the left side of the car, that's because when a car spins out, it usually spins out counterclockwise. The critical combination of speed and yaw usually only happens at super speedways, where speeds can reach 200 or 205 miles an hour. Fox's telemetry shows that Kozlowski was going about 177 miles per hour when he was turned. The car had slowed to 165 to 170 miles per hour at the point where the rear wheels of the car left the ground. Now we've seen cars spin out by themselves at those speeds and not take to the air. The difference here, I think, is the presence of other cars. When two cars get close to each other, the aerodynamics change. Now, there aren't many full-scale wind tunnels in the world where you can study two cars at a time, and computation of fluid dynamics is hard enough to get right for one car, much less two or three. In Keselowski's accident, Edwards was within a foot of the car throughout most of the spin. The first roof flap deployed at about 90 degrees yaw angle, but Edwards' car was still coming. Because of the angle between the two cars, Edwards' car is pushing air under the rear end of Keselowski's car. And when Carl rushes past, there has to be some change in the path of the air around Keselowski's car. The rear wheels of the car appear to have left the ground even before the second roof flap deploys. Edwards' early accident at Talladega was similar. Keselowski was close to Edwards for much of the spin. But in Edwards' case, the car actually started coming down when the roof flaps deployed until Ryan Newman hit it from behind. The rear of Edwards' car was forced back up and the collision with the 39 was why the 99 went bouncing off the catch fence. Now, even before the Atlanta incident, NASCAR had increased the height of the shark's fin on the left side of the car by an inch. That makes a bigger area for the air to hit. And at Daytona, they even put a shark's fin down the rear deck lid. NASCAR is a bit between a rock and a hard place. They can't change how much downforce is on the car or how it's distributed over the car. Otherwise, Goodyear would have to redesign and retest the tires, and there simply isn't time for that. The most important change, I think, is that when we switch from the wing to the spoiler, NASCAR is going to elongate the rear quarter panel by about four inches. And what that means is that when a car comes sideways or a car spins, a lot less air can get or be pushed underneath the car. We have no guarantee that the new spoiler won't cause new problems. The original reason that they went with a wing on the car of tomorrow is because its greenhouse is taller than the greenhouse on the old car. And that made the air flow differently along the roof of the car and onto the back of the car. That's probably also why the new spoiler doesn't really look anything like the old spoiler. 
Now, speeds at Martinsville, the first race where we'll see the spoiler, are pretty low, so we probably won't get a good test of the aerodynamics until the Cup Series comes here to visit us in Texas. One objective of the new car was to improve safety. I don't think anyone can deny that NASCAR has done an excellent job with that. I do worry that the safeness of the new car, however, may be making the drivers feel a little invincible. New York Times writer Daniel Pierce made an analogy between the Edwards Kozlowski wreck and a pitcher throwing a beanball. Well, in 1920, Cleveland Indians baseball player named Roy Chapman was killed by a beanball. Now, I am a firm believer in karma, but I certainly hope our drivers show some better judgment as to how, when, and where payback occurs.